we won't do anything. We won't publish the the um, the, the the video that's being recorded. So, nevertheless, if you if you do have any kind of issues about uh, us recording, do send uh, do do let us know. Um, so, yes, the the title of the event: PhD Animation Research, Stop Motion Aesthetics, and and as I said, we've got three participants who are each going to give a ten to fifteen minute short presentation on their research in this area. Um, the, um, the, the, the order of the presentations is going to be, first of all, Toby Youngius, who is doing his PhD at, uh, where's my notes gone, at the University of Surrey. Um, his PhD research is into the uncanny qualities of stop motion animation. And he's going to be speaking particularly about Ray Harryhausen's films in his presentation. And then we'll have Laura Beth Cowley, who is doing her uh, practice-led PhD at the University of West of England, looking at 3D printing in the context of stop-motion animation. And then last but not least, Fasna Yazdandust, who is doing her PhD at Anglia Ruskin University on puppet stop-motion animation and materiality. And her presentation is specifically on uh, the stop-motion films of Wes Anderson. Um, so, as I said, the, the 10 to 15 minute presentations from these guys. Um, if you have questions that you would like to ask, we're going to reserve the questions till the end after each of the participants have done their presentations. Um, but you could type them into the chat at any moment, if you like, if, if you need to do that as a, as a kind of a memoir. And we can come back to those questions at, at the end after the presentations. Um, if I don't, if I can't keep up with the questions in the chat and I miss them, miss them out, you know, you, you could always signal them at the end and we're very happy to, for people to join in and, and uh, uh, speak their questions out loud or I, or I can indeed read them for, for, for you. Um, I think that's it really in terms of, is there anything else, Fasna, that I needed to say? No, I think everything is fine. And we can start it. Okay, all right, great. Without further ado then, Toby Jungius is first up. Okay. Uh, I'm just trying to share screen, but apparently host has disabled screen sharing. Well done. That's, that's, I knew there was something else I needed to do. Here it comes. Is that working now, Toby? Uh, yep, that should be, and all right. Uh, so before I begin, uh, can everyone see the slides? Yes. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Without further ado, hello everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, this presentation is part of a broader project on a trend within commercial US stop motion. And what I'm talking about today is part of a chapter in progress on Ray Harryhausen and his films. In this presentation, I'll be providing context on Harryhausen and his reputation before exploring how Harryhausen draws parallels between his creatures and the iconic story of King Kong to elicit a sense of lamentable tragedy to their fates before providing an example of how <clears throat> stop motion enhances the tragic quality of his creatures' deaths. The man you see on the slide before you is Ray Harryhausen, a widely renowned name in the field of special effects. He was the animator who provided the special effects for Jason and the Argonauts, Clash of the Titans, and 13 other fantasy and sci-fi films that ranged from the 1950s to the early 1980s. The action sequences of these features showcased live action actors interacting with beasts, statuesque golems, and an assortment of supernatural creatures which Harryhausen would render through the medium of stop motion. Harryhausen used a split screen rear projection process to intersplice his stop motion animation with live action footage. Harryhausen's reputation and influence extends not only to special effects artists and stop motion animators, but to the film going public and even directors like Peter Jackson, James Cameron and Guillermo del Toro. 
Part of this can be attributed to the marketing of these films, which can be observed in the stills taken from the original trailer for the 1958 film, The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. The trailer showcases uh, sequences which feature Harryhausen's effects, repeatedly proclaiming, this is dynamation, a term devised to distinguish Harryhausen's stop motion from more traditional forms of animation. Features like this trailer indicate that this process of dynamation wasn't just implemented as a piece of technical trickery to be kept secret behind the curtain, but was proudly displayed as a means of drawing viewers in to watch these films. The dynamation for these key action sequences is embedded in the perceived identity of these films. But if that is the case, then what can be said about the identity of the stop motion characters who are front and center in these memorable sequences, Harryhausen's assortment of dynamation creatures. Having established how Harryhausen and his effects became so widely known, I propose that the status of these animated creatures as the main visual attraction for these films makes them not simply dangerous and repulsive monsters that we want to see the heroes vanquish along their journeys, but rather, presents them as fantastical creatures who audiences are encouraged to revel in the act of witnessing them. Far from being repulsive, they are instead attractive to viewers. Therefore, I'm going to suggest in my talk today that as dangerous as these creatures may be in the context of the narrative, there is nevertheless an element at play in these films which allows for the possibility for audiences to be to become enamored with these monsters and even lament their passing when they are eventually defeated. An element of this tragic component can be traced back to one of the most important influences on Harryhausen's career as a stop motion animator, Willis O'Brien. The special effects artists for such films as 1925's The Lost World and most famously the original 1933 King Kong, which Harryhausen has repeatedly cited as the film that sparked his interest in stop motion, eventually leading to him working under Willis O'Brien as an assistant animator on Mighty Joe Young in 1949. Harryhausen would evoke particularly iconic moments from King Kong, the film that had such an effect on him in his own work. In King Kong, there is a sequence in which the female lead, Atten, is captured by the native people of Skull Island and offered up to Kong as a sacrifice. Scenes with similar setups can be observed in Clash of the Titans and Sinbad and the Golden Voyage, in which the people of Joppa offer Princess Andromeda to the Kraken and Margiano is presented as a sacrifice to the one-eyed centaur, respectively. These films call to mind the recognizable imagery of the iconic appearance of Kong in his original film, creating parallels between these creatures and Kong, as each monster towers over a woman being offered to them as a sacrifice. This paints these monsters as imposing threats, but it also frames them as creatures who are revered within the narrative, encouraging the audience to also be taken aback by these creatures as they make their grand entrances. With these associations with Kong being made, each film builds on this connection with King Kong by having these creatures share Kong's fate. At the end of King Kong, the ape meets a tragic end as the planes shoot him down from the Empire State Building. It's a memorably tragic conclusion to Kong's tale as humans bring him out of his natural environment and place him in a man-made city in which he is so incompatible that it results in the death of this unique creature. In Clash of the Titans, Perseus arrives on the scene of Andromeda's sacrifice and presents the Kraken and hit with the head of the Medusa, turning it to stone, whereupon the Kraken collapses under its own weight. The Kraken may not be visibly conflicted over inflicting harm on human characters, but much like how Kong was brought to New York in chains, the film twice shows that the Kraken was kept in a cage by the gods of Olympus, let loose only when it suited their purposes. The Kraken, a titan who once ruled over the earth before the gods took over, is reduced to a prisoner, just as Kong was a king on Skull Island, but is brought to New York to entertain crowds. The Kraken is framed as being much less than he once was, or before he is destroyed by the film's live-action human characters. 
After the centaur carries Margiana off in the golden voyage of Sinbad, he appears in the film's climax, assisting the film's villain before being brought down by Sinbad as he repeatedly sends his back. Um, despite being explicitly labeled in the golden voyage of Sinbad as a guardian of evil, the centaur does not harm Margiana, just as Kong does not harm Anne. Additionally, the animation of the centaur's death throes continues for some time, lingering on the creature's pain as it gasps for air and unsuccessfully struggles to remove Sinbad's dagger from the back of his shoulder before finally dying. Through Harryhausen establishing parallels between these creatures and Kong's status as a revered and imposing beast, these similarly violent ends at the hands of the human characters has the potential to be read as the loss of something unique and perhaps even a creature that has been mistreated and misused by the sentient humans and human-like gods around them. Now that I've established a connection between some of Harryhausen's creatures and King Kong's story, I'm going to provide an example of how stop motion contributes to the sense of loss in these scenes by accentuating the moment these creatures cease to move. The movement of stop motion is often compared with the uncanny, a psychological phenomenon associated with that momentary unease we experience when we're uncertain whether to register something as either familiar or unfamiliar, alive or dead. Within stop motion, the viewer is somewhat conscious of the model's lifeless quality as an inanimate object in the real world, but also acknowledges the lifelike qualities of its animated performance. However, in these moments where Harryhausen's creatures cease to move, that tension between the lifelike and unlifelike disappears, which marks a clear distinction from when the creature appeared to be active, albeit in an uncanny fashion, and its deathly inertness. The death scenes of each of Harryhausen's creatures had that much more impact because the uncanny qualities of their stop motion makes us unaware, makes us aware of what life is being instilled in these physical models while they are alive in the context of the narrative. The final shot of 1953's The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms focuses not on the human characters, but on the death of the Redosaurus, indicating how invested the audience is, is expected to be in this creature's ultimate fate. As the silhouette of its body is cast against the flames, the film calls to mind the destruction caused by this creature, and yet its motionless body contrasts against the flickering flames, emphasizing its lifelessness even further. The lingering shot of its inert body invites the possibility that its death is indeed lamentable. Harryhausen's dynamation creatures are embedded in the history of US special effects cinema, and yet in the discussion of the relationship between narrative and US stop motion, they occupy a curious space. It could be argued that they merely serve as a vehicle for the action sequences for these films, and that they aren't meaningfully characterized. But I hope that I've successfully presented the possibility today that as the main source of attraction and the most enduring element of these films, the Harryhausen creatures engender a sense of fantastical wonder to them, which when paired with allusions to the imposing and tragic qualities of King Kong's character and story, as well as the impact of seeing a stop motion model suddenly become inert and entirely lifeless, has the capacity to instill feelings of regret at the lamentable loss of these unique creatures in the world of these narratives. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. That was a, a fascinating presentation. They're very concise. I, I'd, I'd sent you a little message to say you've done 10 minutes. And I thought, you know, bang on, um, 15. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Toby. That, that's fantastic. I think knowing Fasner's interests and, and uh, who's you know, Fasner's the third in, in the um, in the presentations, I can already see connections that we might explore a little bit once once we've once we've heard the three presentations. But holding my thoughts back for the moment, uh, we're going to move now to Laura Beth Cowley. Laura Beth, over to you. All right, hello everyone. Um, yeah. 
So uh, yeah, as Simon mentioned earlier, my name is Laura Beth Cowley. I'm a practice-based PhD researcher based at the Centre for Fine Print Research at the University of West England here in Bristol. Um, in my research, I'm looking at the use of 3D printing as a digital tool in the stop motion industry. And as part of the investigation, I'm conducting practice-led research using 3D printing to investigate various theoretical elements of my research. Uh, today, I will be speaking to you about one of my most recent case studies that was conducted in collaboration with auteur filmmaker Ainsley Henderson. So for those of you who may not be aware of Ainsley's work, here is a short clip from his 2018 short film Stems. Um, Ainsley Henderson is a BAFTA winning animator, director and writer. His work often uses lo-fi craft aesthetic puppet making processes, utilizing found objects and organic materials. His films are often reflective, self-aware and use animation as both a medium and a narrative device. Often working by himself or with creative partner Will Anderson, Ainsley could be referred to as a hyper auteur as much of the time he, made, he makes all elements of the visual work himself from writing to puppet fabrication, from lighting to shooting, and of course, animating and directing. Uh, inspired by the reflective nature of Ainsley's films, I decided to contact him back in late 2019 to discuss the potential of working collaboratively on a project that would look at the use of 3D printing as a unique visual material in and of itself. Arriving, um, aiming to create a piece that would reflect on the faults and abnormalities of the printing process in a poignant and narrative way and reflect on the way 3D printing materials have their own aesthetic within the medium of stop motion. Uh, however, whilst discussing this project, an opportunity arose to work with Ainsley on his upcoming BAFTA funded film, Shackle. Uh, Shackle is a short animated film that follows three archetypical spirits exploring conflicted human drives of creativity, possessiveness and our desire for status. The film follows three characters referred to in the script as she, him, and it. As the story unfolds, the characters become more and more envious and covetous of the object of their desire. The film is going to be shot in, real, in the real world, in a real life wooden surrounding, and is shot over the course of a year in all seasons. Um, as a film with no dialogue, the eyes of the individual puppets play a pivotal narrative role in portraying to the, audiences, to the audience thoughts, ideas, and emotions as they arise in the characters. So this became the focus of the study. The aim and the objectives were drawn thusly. To create eye mechanisms for free scales that allow for subtle movement and post-process customization, as well as in shot replacement of the internal eyeball. Create hollow full eyeballs that allow for internal painting to create depth and be adaptable and reusable for future projects. Use collaborative and iterative action research to develop an eye mechanism that achieves the status aim, uh, the stated aims by creating a scaled CAD design process to create files and work with SLA resin printers to create lightweight, high detail parts for use in auteur production. As part of my overall study, this case study was to sit within a section of my thesis to do with authorship, to question how 3D printing could be used to give greater authorial control to filmmakers whose work is hyper auteur who work in a hyper alter way. So keeping Ainsley's Autoria voice throughout the process was important to me and the study. I was to act as an advisor, a facilitator of the process and aid where possible, but it was a paramount importance to keep Ainsley as involved as possible at every stage of the design process. So Ainsley had created some initial test designs having recently taught himself Blender. The first test provided to be too unstable due to the lack of in lack of an enclosure for the eyeball and a lack of stability in the stem at the back. Um, it was subsequently decided that the eyelid should also be part of the design, at which stage Ainsley provided a second test, this time with an external cup to house both eyelids and eyeballs. These, uh, these brackets would allow the eyelids to pivot around the eyeball and this raised bed would keep the eyeballs elevated within the socket. However, once printed, there were two main issues. Firstly, the printing type, which was, um, which was a printing type called FDM, which is, stands for Fused Deposit Modeling, and is from the form of 3D printing you are all 
probably most acquainted with, which is when a cord's string of plastic is pushed out of a nozzle in layers over time to create a 3D object. By using this material, it created textural ridges, which would require a lot of post-processing, which would not only take time, but would reduce the accuracy of the print overall. Secondly the, secondly, the design of the joint proved difficult to construct after printing, as you had to bend the lids aggressively to fit over the brackets, leading to breakages. Um, at this stage of the case study, it was decided that I would take over the CAD modeling of the project, and on my suggestion, we would look at using Finer, a finer, more detailed 3D printing technology known as SLA, which is which stands for stereo, stereolithography. This involved using light. This involves using light to cure very thin layers of resin, layer by layer, creating an overall finer finish with much higher tolerance accuracy. Uh, so our further design was sketched by Inslee, as you can see here. Um, at which point, I created an initial design. Um, a further requirement arose for a set of slitted eyelids to work with the socketed system. So two alternative designs were created. Um, we chose to use Formlabs SLA printers as leaders in accuracy and their range of materials available. Uh, an initial material tests were created to assess and address any tolerance controls that may have come into play when transferring the digital design into physical into the physical. Although SLA offers a good like for like result, once printed, there is always the possibility for organic flaws to occur during the printing and curing process. So after receiving and reviewing the last, the test objects, a series of iterative changes were made to fulfill all requirements set out in the initial aim, as well as some additional designs featured that were raised during the initial testing stages. So here's a video that just sort of shows you through uh, the CAD designs, but I'm gonna talk over this to explain why things were made. So as discussed earlier, three scales were needed for the three puppets at the center of the film. The smaller of which is also required to have overlapping slitted eyes lids like that of a camera iris, as well as normal sliding eyelids like that of a human. There was a desire to keep the more mechanical parts such as the internal cup as thin as possible, but there was also a particular practical functional layer thickness requirements that had to be adhered to. Essentially, the smaller the thickness, the more fragile the piece would become. At the end of the day, we are talking about resin at, at a thickness of between 0.5 to 1.5 mil thick. Uh, the, medium and larger scale, the medium and larger scale only required human-like eyelids that met in the middle, but the changes in overall scale altered the, the cl clearance and tolerance between parts, which meant that each scale had to be tweaked in areas that were meant to sit together or glide over one another. This was of particular importance when considering the clips that were housed into recesses on either side of the internal or external cup. A stalk was added to the back, both to keep the internal cup aloft and at the right position within the overall design, as well as stopping the eyelids from rotating to the back, making it harder for the animator to move them into position. The tolerances of the eyeballs within their cup itself was also of importance as it needed to sit snugly, but also allowed distance for post-processing processing and adding of a lacquer to create a shiny wet look surface to the eyeballs. There was also some consideration for the need for some kind of lubrication, which ended up not being necessary in the end. Uh, Material-wise, a mix of grey and white standard resin were used, much of which was done in white, as the only thing that needed to meet a specific colour profile was the eyeballs themselves. Everything else was going to be enclosed. By keeping much of the print to one material and one colour, it meant we were able to fill up entire beds of printed printers to make it more cost effective. However, we did use an elastic resin for the internal cup of the smallest set of eyes to reduce the clearance as much as possible. Since the study, we have looked at potential of using tougher, more durable and rigid resins created for more impact me mechanical parts, also offered by Formlabs to address the issue of breakages of the ex uh, extremely small thin pieces, such as the eyelids. After the prints were created, began the task of post-processing and construction, such as sanding and removing any support from the printing process. After which Ainsley began to apply his signature of foreal aesthetic to the pieces. Experiment, experimentation led him to incorporate natural fibers and materials to the manufactured pieces. By using colored wool fiber to construct the iris, 
painting the inside of the pupil black and using resin to dome over the eyeball, then applying a couple of thin layers of lacquer, he was able to create these beautiful mesmeric eyes with depth and craft built into them. Uh, the eye systems were housed in three entirely different puppets. They were to work together and be part of the same world, but offer different expressions and performances largely through their eyes and gestural movements. So in conclusion, the study provided the filmmaker with a bespoke system for both this current project and future projects. The eye mechanisms are customizable whilst remaining structurally and mechanically functional. This combining of traditional and, uh, traditional and digital craft has in effect allowed for a greater level of detail and complexity to be afforded to the filmmaker, whilst also providing a future way of working that may give him his films a greater authorial fingerprint. By involving the filmmaker in every aspect of the process, the study has provided new knowledge and new ways of working to the filmmaker whilst keeping his authority over the output. A full conclusion will only be possible when the film is completed, and we can see how impactful and important a role the eyes play in the film, and how, this have come, and how this comes across to the audience. But for now, I believe the filmmaker is satisfied with what was achieved. Um, I've been granted special permission from Ainsley to show you the completed puppets at the stage, but only for a short while. So uh, here we are. That'll be lovely. Um, and that's it. Thank you all for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Laura Beth. That's great. Um, more connections uh, to my mind uh, 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 being possible pos possible to make between between the presentation so far. But we have one more before we before we get to questions and, and open things up a bit a bit more, and that's Fars uh, Neyaz mm. Dust. Okay. Hello everyone, my name is Fazane, and today in my presentation I'm going to discuss the way physical materials are exhibited in Wes Anderson animation as independent entities rather than the means only to serve the narrative. This is a part of my PhD thesis on the specificity of stop motion animation and the photographic reality in Wes Anderson and Susie Templeton's puppet animation. Wes Anderson is mainly a live action filmmaker with his own unique style of filmmaking. Uh, with regards to animation, he insists on employing uh, stop motion puppet animation in its traditional fashion. Uh, by emphasizing uh, traditional fashion, I mean that it gives him the opportunity to play with the physical materials as well as the specificity of stop motion animation. He has directed two uh, puppet animations, Fantastic Mr. Fox and Isle of Dogs, and my focus today is on Fantastic Mr. Fox. In order to clarify what I mean by exhibition's approach, it would be helpful to take a look at the idea of Tom Gunning's about the cinema of attractions. In order to discuss the cinema of attractions, Tom Gunning put it in contrast to the narrative cinema and um, offers that films before 1906 aimed to display something, whether it be the image or the device of that image, uh, the device uh, which the image was made by or the process of making the image. They just wanted to uh, encourage the audience to see something. So as the primary goal uh, was visibility, the narrative was of the second importance, if at all. Uh, in this respect, uh, Gunning considers Lumiere's actuality films and Melies uh, early trick films as the instance of uh, cine uh, the cinema of attraction because um, Lumiere tried to exhibit what was happened in front of his camera while uh, Melies tried to show the capability of camera uh, in uh, creating the extraordinary images. So Gunning suggests that 
Cinema of attraction addresses the audience directly, arouses curiosity, and supplies pleasure. Uh, as a kind of strategy, uh, the cinema of attraction try to acknowledge the audience. And uh, for example, the actors look directly at the camera or go to it, but it can spoil the realistic illusion of cinema. So the narrative cinema tends to conceal all the traces of its production. Gunning also um, suggests that narrative films dominated the cinema of attractions after 1906, but the cinema of attractions survived in avant-garde films. Therefore, the cinema of attractions is self-reflexive while the narrative cinema is self-sufficient. The cinema of attractions addresses the audience while the narrative cinema absorbs the audience. The, 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 uh, the cinematic devices in the cinema of, att of attractions are the characters themselves, while the cinematic devices in narrative cinema are in the service of the characters uh, in order to create a world of narrative. Considering that, I'm going to argue that the physical materials in Fantastic Mr. Fox are characters and their attractions dominate the narrative. Wes Anderson tends to employ stop motion animation in its traditional fashion because in stop motion, physical materials are in their most visible condition. Also, as the puppets and um, the sets are miniatures and the distance between them and the camera is very short, the camera is a magnifier. Also, uh, because all the process happen in three-dimensional um, environment, the laws of physics can uh, affect the final illusion of movement. Ms. Anderson tends to employ the materials, the physical materials as they are in their um, a very natural condition. That's why there are so many closest, uh, close textures in the images. So an excess of haptic information is given to the audience and the audience are always aware of the presence of physical materials. And all the physical materials in Fantastic Mr. Fox uh, can remind uh, the, the audience of their presence and the audience's um, prior experience with them in their everyday life. Fantastic Mr. Fox is made in CGI era um, in which um, digital VFX was and is uh, extensively employed in uh, live action movies and animation as well. But Wes Anderson uses physical materials in order to create the flowing visual materials such as water and uh, smoke and fire. Um, this uh, approach, uh, for instance, um, give the opportunity to the cotton to, pre uh, to preserve its look and condition while it is stimulating the smoke, as we can see in this steel in the bottom. Also using physical materials as visual effects, display the mastery of animators, refer the audience to the, pro uh, to the process of animation and show them the trick. In this respect, it evoked the question of how in audiences mind they will uh, constantly ask how these concrete materials were kept um, suspended and manipulated frame by frame. Here are some examples of using physical materials as visual effects in Fantastic Mr. Fox and the video doesn't have sound. Uh, 
Another consequence of the short distance between sets, puppets, and the camera is the shallow depth of field of the image. It means that the materials uh, that are closer to the camera are very sharp and focused while the rest of the image is fluid. It somehow can accentuate the uh, physicality of the materials in the focused areas and um, make the uh, details extremely visible. Close-ups and extreme close-ups can, uh, can be found uh, numerously in fantastic Mr. Fox. Um, the close-ups can put the materials in their most visible conditions in the way that all the details are extremely visible. For instance, in these uh, images, you can see all the uh, stitches of the knitted uh, bandit hats and the jacket. So these close-ups are a kind of intriguing and uh, invite the audience to see uh, what they, they are showing in these pictures. Um, as if the materials look directly at the camera. Uh, in these two instances, the close-ups uh, don't have any narrative function. They are here just for the sake of displaying. And here we can see that, that uh, we can see the difference between close-ups in the service of narrative and the close-ups uh, for the purpose of exhibition. Accidents are inherent in stop motion animation. The prominent example of accident is arbitrary movement. By arbitrary movement, I mean the specific kind of motion that is rendered as a result of constant touch of the animator on the um, puppets. Uh, in particular, when the puppets are covered by fair or textile, because these are the kind of materials that are really likely to be modified unintentionally during the process. So uh, such kind of uh, movements will be uh, produced. The arbitrary movement can highlight the physicality of materials and their condition. Also, they can be fairly um, audience to the presence of an animator because the arbitrary movement can be considered as the fingerprints of, of the animators. And as such, they create attraction in stop motion puppet animation. And I have written a whole a chapter in my thesis about arbitrary movement. And there I suggested that arbitrary movement can be employed as um, a kind of um, um, sub narrative supporter uh, in the way that by decreasing or increasing in the amount of arbitrary movement, for instance, the inner emotion of the puppet's characters can be shown. And for instance, when the, the, when the puppet um, is stationary uh, for a period of time, arbitrary movement can be helpful to uh, make them look lively. But in Fantastic Mr. Fox, the arbitrary movement in the puppets are all the result of the, the numbers of the time that the, the puppets are touched by the animator. And they, as such, are the specific effects of stop motion puppet animation. And as such, they are attractions. Here are some examples of, arbit of arbitrary movement in fantastic Mr. Fox, and you can clearly see the traces of the hand of animators on the puppets. In conclusion, the physical materials are the main characters in Fantastic Mr. Fox, the textures, of course. The textures speak for themselves in this animation. They are not the mere tools for storytelling. And finally, materials and the ways they are treated, I mean, the devices and the way uh, that um, they are employing are the attractions of Fantastic Mr. Fox.
Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Fasna. Very good, thanks. Great, well, everyone has kept a time extraordinarily well uh, and, and provided us with um, uh, numerous things to think about. And, and, and uh, I think there's lots of connections between the presentations. Now, I'm sure that the presenters have questions for one another. And I know, I know certainly that they'd like to take questions from, from um, um, the, the, the audience, as it were. Um, so if you would like to um, ask any of the three presenters a question, we're very happy for you to raise a hand and speak out loud. That would be fantastic. Um, we're very happy also if you'd like to simply type them in, into the chat and I can read them out or indeed Laura, Beth, Fasner or, or Toby can read them out. So do, do feel, feel free to um, present your questions to the group in whichever fashion you'd like. Um, perhaps I can have the first go though. Um, a phrase that sticks in my mind, Laura Beth, from your um, presentation was to do with the faults and abnormalities of 3D printing. Um, and it, it seemed to me that when you were um, describing to us the process by which the, these objects are being 3D printed, it, it, it's, it's a very, it seems to be a very precise industrial process. Nevertheless, it seemed to me to be key for you that there was some kind of faults or abnormalities still possible in the transition from the, 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 the model uh, once it's printed. And I, I would, I would, I'd quite like to hear a little bit more about that. Where, what are the abnormalities of, uh, um, and faults of 3D printing? And, 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 and perhaps we could trace that through the other two presentations too. Toby, I wondered, you know, do, does, did Ray Harryhausen think of his art as embracing aspects of uh, uh, what Fasner calls um, arbitrary motion, which comes with uh, using those kinds of fur-like textures in, in his puppets? Um, is, there, is there a thread to do with faults and abnormalities, whether it's uh, traditional stop motion puppet animation or, or 3D printing? Uh, yeah, so um, technically or traditionally, no, the whole point of using 3D printing is to sort of erase those flaws. Uh, but I'm interested, I'm interested in the kind of the complex kind of conversation between that of like, as, uh, as Fasner mentioned, as obviously discussed in her talk, that's one of the main features of stop motion. So why are we erasing it? Which is a big part of my argument for uh, the way in which it's being used. So although this case study, as you rightly said, doesn't really feature those flaws because it, it, the project went on a different direction that that section was about why I'd initially got in contact with Ainsley. Uh, but then because this other project came in and he needed something 3D printed, that sort of took over. Uh, so I'm my another case that I'm doing currently is sort of looking more at that aspect of it about um, the flaws. And it's going back to that FDM style printer, which you, this is an FDM printer. Um, so it sort of uses a coil piece of plastic that melts through and there's a lot of flaws that you don't want that come up all the time with them. But I was interested as a stop motion animator and uh, filmmaker by trade, um, how you could utilize those, those kind of natural flaws. So with FDM printing, the main one being that you get these quite distinct layer lines. Mm -hmm. So I'm making a film at the moment that's using those layer lines as a visual device. Um, and me and Ainsley were talking about doing a project about that possibly after my PhD is done because he has this film to finish. Um, but that also utilizes that kind of idea because I think that's what's kind of not missing, but is an area that's sort of under uh, investigated within the combination of stop motion and 3D printing. There have been people that have used it, but generally it's either used to be like, oh, look, this is 3D printed. Isn't that cool? Um, and there's one film that was made by the National Film Board of Canada that used 3D printing um, to create like wrinkles on the face of a character that sort of utilized the, the natural flaws of 3D printing um, or the natural facets of 3D printing in a kind of 
visual narrative way. Well, to combine the uh, your question, Simon, with a question I've seen uh, Eugene has brought up about how if uh, how far might arbitrary movement disrupt audience empathy for characters and particularly in moments of pathos. I think that for Ray Harryhausen, it's, I certainly know that he is of stop motion, often referring to it as a nightmarish, uh, it, has that, it has a nightmarish quality to it. I think that for the materiality and the arbitrary mo motions of it, it's, uh, I think, manifested as something that would be an extension of that. It's a sort of tangent from empathy, but selling the vitality of the creatures that he would animate. And I think that there would be one of the first pieces of feedback he got given from his uh, mentor, Willis O'Brien, when he, he was very young, he sent off some uh, animation he had done himself, and uh, he got some uh, criticism that he, his the musculature and the anatomy of his uh, dinosaurs that he had animated looked like sausages, that they didn't actually feel like it was selling that. And I think that from that point onward, he studied that quite a bit to make sure that he could sell the that interiority, that feeling that these were animals you were looking at, the creatures that even if they were fantastical, like not just dinosaurs or uh, fictional takes on now extinct creatures, but entirely fantastical or sci-fi creatures, he wanted to convey that feeling of like setting you on the creature being alive. And I think that moments of those arbitrary movements, far from to me sort of disrupting audience empathy or connection with the animated subject, actually enhance and uh, because there's a there's a different uh, different way of engaging with stop motion where as far as I know, you say the materiality becomes the attraction and to me that means that the characters become the materials that they are represented by and that means that with in Ray Harryhausen uh, there was a saber tooth tiger in the third Sinbad film he did which would feature that same level of uh, arbitrary movement in the fur as between frames and I think that that actually gives the materials that vibrancy that vitality and in the context of uh, Fantastic Mr Fox I think that it's in moments of pathos it means that you can actually see there's a feeling of interiority internal thinking that even if the characters don't express anything, there is a m movement, a subtle movement there. And in the case of Harryhausen, I think that that just sells the idea that these are living natural creatures, which just makes that their destruction and their deaths all the more, like it sells that. Um, I think initially arbitrary movement is a kind of effect specific to stop motion animation. And we as audiences, when we are encountering a film, we know that this is stop motion and there are some expectations from us. And this, I think, um, helps that those flows, imperfections, or, or anything we call that arbitrary movement, um, avoid you know, being um, disruptive uh, in, in this respect. And then it's, it depends on how much do you, um, you know, use them. For instance, in Fantastic Mr. Fox, the Anderson approach arbitrary movement as um, something to experiment. In I Love Dog, if you, if you see that, there is a kind of consistency. There is a coherent use of arbitrary movement. And it, it, it's not that much disruptive 
as it is in fantastic masterworks. So there are so many factors in this respect. You cannot, you know, choose. You, you cannot um, talk about arbitrary movement without considering these, um, you know, factors. Uh, could I just ask the Afaz and Toby specifically about the connection between these two the filmmakers that you're looking at, Wes Anderson and, and Harry Housen, and their use in a way, to my, to, to my sense, that it's a similar kind of a technique that they're using, presumably. Um, uh, are they, is there, a, I mean, Fasner, you talked about uh, Wes Anderson making stop motion puppet animations in a traditional fashion, there being a tradition to the to the, the his way of working. Do you see links between the the two filmmakers? Is, is that is it obvious? Exactly. It, it, it's really obvious that Wes Anderson is under the you know influence of Ray Harryhausen. Um, he um, admits that in in many of his interviews that he wants to use stop motion animation as Ray Harryhausen did. And uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's I, I think there is a connection between them. And is there something to do, I mean, I know Fasner from supervising your, your, your dissertation, that you're interested in the, the exploring the kind of a realism associated with this uh, arbitrary motion that it points somehow or other towards the materiality of the, of the medium. Do, do, we, do we also get something of that in Harryhausen's films because of the conjunction of live action and, and the puppet animation? There's certainly something going on with Harryhausen's animation where I think that it's difficult for anyone uh, working in stop motion to not take some influences in uh, style or approach to him. But I think that actually with Harryhausen, there's this curious sort of paradox or balancing act going on where as much as he is selling you on these creatures, there is this acknowledgement of a divide between the live action and the stop motion that in my mind, it feels as if in both a practical and thematic uh, degree, the stop motion creatures and sequences embody the fantasy of or the fantastical elements of the films they're featured in, whereas the live action elements, the characters, are the elements that are, feel a bit more connected to the real world that the audience is familiar with. And so there, this interplay between them feels as if it's a clash between them where uh, you could do a reading where the, because the so many of these creatures end up dying by the end because they represent threats to the protagonists, that there is some sort of statement of the incompatibility between these two elements, the live action and the real and the stop motion and the fantasy. But at the same time, and this is why I can't say it so categorically, and yet I will have to find a way to do so in the conclusion to my chapter on this, is that the there is a play between stop motion and uh, live action. One sequence that comes to mind is in Clash of the Titans, when Perseus is trying to uh, tame the uh, Pegasus. It's at one point he has lassoed the a horse with a rope. Now, the horse is still being animated in stop motion, but there is a literal thread connecting the stop motion represented uh, Pegasus and the actor playing Perseus holding a rope. And it's because of a clever way of splicing footage of in reality, the actor had a rope around a uh, big uh, rig, essentially, and was interacting with that, whereas in the stop motion, the splicing, it was just put over with the rope connected. And so there is this uh, playfulness, and Harryhausen has even said this, is that even for the time, it wasn't necessarily a case of trying to fool audiences into believing this was real. He was very aware that even back in, in contem for contemporary audiences, it would 
be obvious that this was an effect they were seeing, which is why I think that, uh, Fasner, your idea that stop motion becomes the attraction is the connection that I think that with many stop motion films, particularly because of its, um, its uh, rareness, there is a rare quality to it as this non uh, mainstream form of animation that you, a lot of the audiences come to it to see it as that. So I've gone on a long tangent, so I'm going to stop talking now, but uh, yes, many ideas that connect. I just wanted to mention that I just want to add something that uh, we have to consider that Ray Harryhausen was um, using stop motion as a visual effect. He wants to create the illusion of reality, you know, the, mm. that that was the thing he, he was trying to do. While um, Wes Anderson is using stop motion as animation, as, you know, not uh, in, 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 in the mixture with a live action movie. This is the, the very, you know, um, critical uh, difference between these two filmmakers, that the approach toward uh, stop motion is totally different. Mm -hmm. um, and just as a little aside, if I may, I, I think it's maybe important to also remember the period of time difference there is between the two and the amount of equipment and skill level that Ray was pretty much doing this self-taught by himself blind Mm. And the Fantastic Mr. Fox people, it was an actual choice. They mm. they could choose to have made the puppets differently. They could have choose to articulate the puppets differently and perform it. And they could actually see what was happening on screen as they were doing it, which Ray certainly didn't. Mm. That score, Laura Beth, I, do, I have a question which I think connects to this. And it was beyond the purview of your presentation, but you you mentioned it, to do with the business of um, evaluating the qualities of these 3D printed um, objects. Finally, when, 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 they, when they're part and parcel of the film, uh, you know, as a viewer, you could evaluate the, the particular qualities uh, and faults and abnormalities, etc., uh, of, the, of the printed objects. Um, but what I wondered is, 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 there, is there a stage in the process of shooting those things, the, the puppets, the, 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 the 3D printed aspects, the process of doing the frame by frame shooting, the stop motion, as it were, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the camera, in the filming, that, that somehow or other contributes to the um, material qualities of, of, of those 3D printed objects well yeah because uh, especially as it's it's not this isn't a system of replacements which is often the case with 3d printing that every that the library is there and you have to utilize it in whatever way you can as an animator but this isn't um this isn't that it's a, it's a mechanic so it's in no way different to an armature so the in a, in that way the performance will come from ainsley um the mechanic is just there to give him the best possible range um, available and it's just that little bit above having an eyeball stuck in some plasticine or uh, burrowed into a, he a wooden head and then built around the idea being it mostly comes down to those eyelids and sort of being able to have that real slow subtle movement because you really wanted to have that kind of almost hyper realistic movement in these quite unusual puppets that are also going to have to be shot in a real world environment at ridiculous temperatures um which also means that he does have to have a certain amount of like speed to his movements because if he doesn't get the thing captured in time the whole light of the day is going to have shifted and you might have like he can't um finesse or finagle in the same way that he would do in a studio which sort of adds another kind of level of complexity which was part of the reason why having something a little bit more succinct and something that didn't involve like doing like claymation and having to do individual sculpts of the eye were, was important. So it sort of frees up him as a, as a, as a performer, really. Okay, great. Now, you may have questions for one another, which would be fantastic, uh, fascinating to hear, but I mustn't, 
I feel like if I, if I don't read out the, 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 the questions in the chat here, which have cropped up there now, uh, people will think I'm ignoring them. And I wouldn't want Lizzie Hobbs to think I was ignoring her. Uh, we've had one question from Eugene, which, which um, Toby took on very well. Uh, Lizzie's question is, is arbitrary movement in stop motion perhaps similar to drawn animators using a boiling line to give life an evidence of a human hand? I would argue that no. Nope. It isn't um, purely because the arbitrary movement, as I can, as I understand it from what Masma has been explaining, is it's arbitrary, so it's not constructed. Hmm. Where a boil is constructed, like you can choose not to um, draw multiple frames of a still image to make it have that boil, mm -hmm. but it is there to sort of mimic life but there's a lot more than um, arbitrary movement that is needed to give a puppet some mm. sensation of movement there's it with especially with worse it's those tiny little micro movements in the eyes so mm. the eyeballs even if it's like everything still there'll be this tiny little vibration in the eye that sort of stop or like glistening or something um plasma will know far more about this than me but Wes is very well known for like being like okay and now they don't move for 20 minutes which in, in stop motion terms is days, days and days and days, and it's very painful mm. um, to not give it all the kind of slapstick performance. Mm. I, would, I would argue that uh, in terms of the effect that it can achieve, they, there is some overlap in that the boiling lines just adds extra movement uh, to it. But uh, as you say, particularly with uh, animation that has been achieved with through digital means I think that there is certainly uh, a lot more effort going into deliberately including boiling lines than there is like in terms of it's very specific and the a great example I can think of is a recent uh, game called uh, Later Alligator which has a like this very charming uh, style to it and all of the characters have this kind of accentuated messiness and eccentricity to them because of the boiling lines but when you take a look at it it is very much something that is obviously deliberately uh, included i think with the closest example i can think of is when uh, with Ardman, the famous anecdote that they will sometimes deliberately include thumbprints, not just like leave them in, but actually uh, put them in to the point of even in some of their CG work, like uh, Arthur Christmas putting it in certain frames. That is a similar level of, I think, manufactured arbitrariness that uh, I think overlaps. But um, it's, it's a sort of like messy thing where I think that there is overlap in terms of the effects, but at the end of the day, because they're the results of different means of production in different media. So there is always going to be some specificity that delineates the two. I'd also argue that potentially the, the boil in stop motion comes from the camera and the atmos on set rather than the puppets or the, or the animation, because that's the kind of shimmeriness from being in volume and also being the fact that in stop motion like what would be referred to as the boil or what this arbitrary movement is is referred to as noise and noise like if you think of it in terms of sound where it obviously comes from is a unwanted element technically um, this is too quite nice um points made by Cathy. I think one is a recommendation for, for reading on, on Anders and, and stop motion, uh, physical effects and stop motion um, in the stop motion films. And a suggestion of the boiling line. Um, is there sometimes in animations to hide the inertia of the illusion of animation whilst arbitrary motion is much more purposeful in Anderson's work? It's interesting, you know, it's purposeful perhaps, Fasner, but in a way, there's something chance about it, isn't it? There's something out of the control of the, of the, of the animator, um, which I think is probably the, the, the unique aspect of it. Um, Mariam, 
maybe if we think of animating with pain as it uh, or paint as it dries, then it could be similar to the arbitrary motion. Firstly, I like the idea of animating with pain. Paint. All animation is animation with pain. Yeah, um, it goes without saying, doesn't it? But I'd also say that um, a painted animation, although is a 2D technique, it is also stop motion because it's happening under camera. It is so made like of materials. Hybrid. Yeah, it's that kind of hybrid space, like cut out animation. Mm. As far as it's unintentional and out of control, it can be arbitrary. I think that uh, whenever we're, whenever you're dealing with comparisons between uh, things that certain uh, approaches to filmmaking or animation can achieve, there's always going to be some connections, but there will always be a certain amount of um, getting lost in the details of trying to make it fit in the same way that like genre applying a genre can sometimes lead you twisting and not. So I think that a lot of the time it does culminate into this uh, place where you are saying that they're, 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 they're being created in different spaces, I think. I think we may wrap up in a minute. What do you think, guys? Um, unless it, it would be nice if you had, I didn't want to cut you off in, in case you had questions for each other after your presentations, or, or maybe you'd like to continue those discussions outside. But um, is there anything you wanted to raise about each other's presentations, thoughts you had, connections you made? I just was really curious about. Um flow in 3D printing, Laura Beth. I just want you, if you can, um, you know, explain it a little bit. What kind of flow can occur in, in 3D printing? What you mentioned of... something about flows. Flaws. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so there's a quite nice website that's called like 3D printed glitches. And it's basically when the 3D printer just decides it doesn't want to work for a while and so there's it's all to do with uh, especially when it comes to FDM printing which is the coiling system I told you about a lot of that comes down to the layer height so the individual height that the nozzle is going between the layers and um, the adhesion to the base but sometimes there's this really fun thing that can happen where it just goes okay I'm not going to adhere anymore to that layer and it just keeps coiling and coiling and coiling you don't see it happening so you have this beautifully rendered piece so like half a body and then all of a sudden it will just spaghetti noodle stuff forever and I find that area kind of interesting like if there's a because it's that difficult thing with stop motion of like like this idea of arbitrary things or things that don't or flaws or glitches or problems or noise but also needing it to be actually precise and actually work so it's interesting in this idea of being able to manufacture those flaws in a stable way so you could still have like replacements but by its inherent nature you can't always manufacture those flaws because they won't in won't be flaws anymore they'd be manufactured faults i guess then then this is the matter of machine this is the the flow in machine and for instance, for, for in, in higher technologies, it, it can be removed, it can be solved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it, the flaws that come are from, okay, so there's two things. So there's the flaws that come from it just not being set up properly like that. And then there's the flaws that aren't really flaws, they're just facets of the printing process. So uh, with this particularly, it's the, the fact that you do have those layer lines. The other thing being that often with um, both this and SLA printing, you need um, like structures to hold the thing in place so that it doesn't like weep as it goes. So uh, which of course supports. And so there have been examples of people using 3D printing um, and keeping the supports to represent other visual mediums. So uh, Job Joris and Meriki, who are I think Dutch animators, they did a nice uh, short uh, music video series of GIFs that had um, characters using this SLA printing with these really interesting tree-like support systems and the support was representing gravity because it was for a, um, an album called Gravity. 
So it's sort of showing the physical action of gravity. So it's it's being able to do that thing that quite common when you're sort of doing stop motion and things that are addressing the materiality of the process is using those things that are like negatives or flaws as a narrative device. Yeah, you know, because I, I have the, the machines that, for example, like a studios views. And I, I was thinking what, what kind of flaws they can, you know, face. So one of their major like flaws, but was a, a flaw, but ended up being an asset was that the type of printing they use is kind of powder printing and that doesn't, the technology requires you to have no support so you don't need anything to hold it, it sort of, it uh, creates layers in this big bed of powder and the powder acts as a support as it's being cured, so you don't end up with any of those kind of traditional flaws. The difference being the, or the natural attribution of that printing is that it has this kind of powdery dusty texture to it that you can blast off but they chose not to on uh, for example Paranorman because it actually helped with the lighting to soften the focus so that you didn't get that horrible plasticky shininess that you would do from things made of plastic or resin um, so in that sense it's it's using like I said the natural attributes of the 3d printer uh, mm -hmm. not only for its mechanical purposes and what it was really manufactured for which was engineering but also as a visual device which you know, and, and Leica particularly were very instrumental in, in incorporating color into prints. And so they did a lot of work with those printers to get that. So now there's this incredible breadth of, of visual um, color and, and systems that you can put into 3D printing that wouldn't really have existed without, as far as I'm aware, without Leica. Um, and it may only be of use to Leica, but it's still there <laughs> if people yeah, want. Exactly. That and they have a like very it. powerful team uh, for for their um, softwares. Yeah, so they, you know, they're able because they had that partnership with that company from day one. They've also been able to develop the technology with the people. So they have engineers and coders and programmers, as well as like very uh, intelligent and trained animators, CG modelers. Yeah, okay. it's it's a. Uh, and that's why they have the same team that they've had for like the last 10 years and why they're mm. constantly able to innovate and do more and more spectacular visual things. I love the ideas of this and what your presentation was about, Laura Beth, about how technology, I think that a lot of, at, at first it's, there's a romanticization of everything for this one piece of art was built from the ground up, but the reality, and I think this is actually a much more exciting uh, scenario, is that technologies don't, they roll forward and they get innovated upon. And so when technology is created in the process of one production, it will actually have a fundamental effect on the next ones and can make the process of putting it together so much more like efficient. And I think that that's a it's it's one of those things that the technical and i think in the industry of animation and just technology is has fantastic possibilities in that regard i think it's one of those interesting things about like incorporating digital tools and technology into things is that the assumption is that it's been done to make it easier or quicker but actually all it's done is made it far more complex than it ever was mm. and it, well for then like learning from what they're going to go okay so this is how we could simplify they're like no let's now print every single mm -hmm. frame and then let's add complexity and texture and pattern into all of those things and how can we get get greater and greater depth so rather than which i feel like is a very a artist if it be animated trait of like i could take the easy road but let's see how i can make this mm -hmm. far more uh complicated <laughs> than it needs mm -hmm. to be and stop motion is a particularly good one for that Mm, the recipe is a let's get uh, proof of concept and then that means that when we get to the next one we can innovate upon that and it sort of refine and expand upon that. Mm, exactly. mm. Fantastic, it's, it's, it's wonderful to hear you <laughs> speaking about each other's ideas and presentations and, and then coming, coming together with, with more ideas. Um, I think we, we, will, we will wrap it up here. Um, so I want to say thank you very much to everyone who's joined us for these presentations. It's great to have a, a, a people here and indeed chipping in with questions. 
Um, it would be nice. I was just thinking, um, Laura, Beth, Farzana, Toby, you did probably flash up your email addresses, I think, in the context of your presentations. But if you would like to put your email addresses in the chat here, um, then people have them on screen for a little bit longer. Should they want to contact you and, 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 and if they've got questions that they haven't asked or want to follow anything up with you? Um, and whilst you're doing that, um, I just wanted to say thank you very much to you three for, for, your, for your great presentations, uh, which are very stimulating. And uh, thank you very much also to Farzana, especially, who's, I keep saying it's her gig. She, she organized this and said, Simon, let's, can we, can we, can we do, can we have a PhD animation research seminar and invite, you know, do it on Zoom and have it um, in, in this format. And um, I'm, I'm very glad she's done it. And it's the first one, PhD animation research, colon stop motion aesthetics not a very jazzy title but um perhaps there could be a more jazzy title but anyway it suggests to me that there could be more in the series so um perhaps there's people in the audience here who'd who'd like to contribute to such a thing if there's another theme to do with phd animation research in the uh, in, in the in the in the next in the series maybe fausner is the one to get in touch with if you'd like to um contribute to such an event yeah please i just wanted to say if, if anyone can take my words to um you know um, whoever you know that is is doing phd or is about to start doing a phd please come and contribute to this um you know series of events because after a while it can be a very reliable um database for for the people who are interested uh, because we are going to um document all these events and uh, at the end, I just want to thank Simon for your support and encouragement for this event and thank Tabi and Laura Beth uh, for you know, trusting me and being the first person to contribute to um, this event. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Farzana, and thank you, Simon, both of you. This has been a great occasion and thank you, uh, Laura Bear for your presentation. This has just been a delight. <laughs> Good luck with the PhDs, guys. Thank you. Thank you for reaching out. And to anyone uh, present who's also going through their PhDs or whatever research, good luck to all of you guys as well. Solidarity. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cheerio. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.